How can we better identify patients at risk for atrial fibrillation? In this episode of Critical Conversations on Atrial Fibrillation, a master class series, Drs. Sean Picorni and Emily P. Zeitler examine the characteristics associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation and discuss the latest tools that can be used to detect it and guide decisions about anticoagulation therapy. Welcome to episode two, where we'll talk about profiles in comorbidity, including identifying patients at high risk for atrial fibrillation, as well as understanding what the stroke risk factors are for these patients. And in this episode, we're going to focus our attention on the patient characteristics associated with increased risk of atrial fibrillation, as well as the tools that will help us decide on how to manage these patients around anticoagulation, specifically looking at the chads vas score and the Hasbled score. I thought it might be helpful to start with a patient case study. And so this is a case of a 62-year-old woman with hypertension and no other cardiovascular risk factors who presents with symptoms of fatigue and palpitations. In terms of the workup, the patient has an echocardiogram, which demonstrates a low normal LV function with no valvular disease, but a severely dilated left atrium. The patient has a patch monitor that's placed and that shows that the patient has 100% AFib burden on the monitor with an average heart rate of 72 beats a minute. So Emily, when we think about that 100% AFib burden, you know, how does that make you describe this patient and, and how do you then approach stroke risk? This is a, this is a great case because this is a really common scenario. I could pull this from my clinic tomorrow. I'll see probably five of these really common and it's a tough situation. So, you know, a patient with a hundred percent atrial fibrillation in our, in our contemporary labeling, this is um, persistent AFib. Uh, there are a lot of ways uh, describing this that aren't, aren't very helpful. Uh, chronic AFib being one of them, saying someone has chronic AFib isn't helpful because even a patient who has um, paroxysmal AFib that comes and goes, it might be chronically so. So um, it's, it, the words do matter here and I would call this patient persistent AFib. Now, her stroke risk is tricky because some of the ubiquitous stroke risk scores that we use, and I'll just go ahead and talk about um, Chad's VASC as perhaps the most common one of these, um, it doesn't really capture all of her stroke risk. So she's a woman, which gives her a point for uh, being in the female sex category, and she has hypertension, which gives her a point for that comorbidity. And so uh, her total risk score is a two, and so the CHADS VASC risk score on its own without any other information would suggest um, that we should consider anticoagulation in her case. Now, the reason I think this is a little challenging is because not all risk factors are created equally. And in fact, when we think about female sex, especially at the lower risk scores uh, for CHADS VASC, female sex is really doesn't count the same as it, as it would at a higher risk. And so really a woman with hypertension um, epidemiologically would act more like a CHADS VAS score of one. And so in this patient, you actually may lean towards not anticoagulating since the risks of anticoagulation might outweigh the benefits or might not be sufficient to justify the added bleeding risk from um, chronic oral anticoagulation. On the other hand, she has a dilated left atrium and low normal LV function, and both of those things likely contribute significantly um, to her risk of stroke, as does the persistence of her atrial fibrillation. And so when I think about this patient, um, even though Chad's VASC might call her a two, there are some things that make her more like a one and some things that make her more like a three or a four. And, and I mentioned some of those, uh, you know, including a dilated left atrium, low normal LV ejection fraction, um, and the persistent AFib. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right, Emily. You know, one of the things that I'll use as a tiebreaker for some of these patients is an NT pro BNP. And there's data that really shows that when you risk stratify patients really across Chad's VASC scores, and you look at their NT pro BNP, as the NT pro BNP goes up, their risk of stroke goes up within a specific CHADS VASC score. And so for patients where you're, you're more on the borderline trying to decide, that can certainly be a tiebreaker in those patients. Yeah, that's really helpful. And, and it sort of brings to mind this idea that when we're talking about atrial fibrillation and AFib related stroke, really what we're trying to get our mind around, and the reason it's so hard is because 
AFib is, uh, in many cases, not all cases, but in, in most cases of atrial fibrillation, the AFib, the arrhythmia itself, is actually a symptom of an underlying atrial myopathy, which is why, for example, um, in stroke stop, um, we saw that even in the absence of, of a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, when the chads vas score was applied to a population, we saw increased risk of stroke based on that chads vas score alone, again, even in the absence of an AFib diagnosis. And so it's a reminder that AFib is a marker of an underlying myopathy that in and of itself increases the risk of stroke. And we see that, um, uh, you know, another Another piece to this puzzle, um, as I mentioned before about AFib burden, um, was really nicely displayed in a study by, uh, by Rachel Kaplan and colleagues, which showed us that um, AFib burden does matter. And you know, you and I both know, Sean, that we could spend hours talking about how much AFib is enough AFib to treat with anticoagulation, um, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. When we think about the, the case that you presented, a patient who's in atrial fibrillation all the time, there's a clear added risk of stroke based on that persistence, that high burden of atrial fibrillation. So, you know, we can, we can, we know that even in the absence of atrial fibrillation, like we learned from stroke stop, that a high CHADS VASC increases the risk of stroke. So when you have high CHADS VASC and low burden of AFib, that might be worth anticoagulating. And the, vice, and the opposite is also true. If you have high burden of AFib and a low CHADS VASC, that may tip the balance in favor of anticoagulating where the benefits of oral anticoagulation outweigh the potential risks. Yeah, I think one of the things that we always struggle with is balancing the risk of bleeding with the risk of stroke. And, and certainly there's the HasBled score out there that's used, that can be used to understand patients' bleeding risk. I, I would say that, you know, clinically, I don't use the HasBled score much. And the rationale for that is, is that many of these factors are not modifiable. And we know that the risk of bleeding tracks with the risk of stroke. And so patients that, with high HasBled also have high CHADS VASC and high risk of stroke. I think that what's really key to remember is that in the European guidelines, they say to focus on the modifiable risk factors. So things like people that are on aspirin, people that are on NSAIDs, patients that have poorly controlled blood pressure or excessive alcohol use, those are factors that really need to be considered to help modify the bleeding risk. So Emily, you know, back to this patient that you mentioned has a CHADS VAS score of two and a severely dilated left atrium, their HASBLED score was also two. And so what would you think about in terms of anticoagulation and other treatment strategies for their AFib? Well, of course, I mean, we're completely glossing over the fact that we'd have to elicit from the patient uh, her specific values and preferences. But assuming that it were entirely up to us, which of course it never is, but if it were, I would probably recommend this patient take anticoagulation chronically. And I would also refer the patient for a strategy to uh, restore and maintain rhythm control for what we expect to be significant benefits long-term from that strategy. Great. So, you know, we talked earlier um, about using things like NT Pro BNP for tiebreakers. You mentioned left atrial size and, and burden of atrial fibrillation as other tiebreakers for patients to consider. I talked a little bit about the HasBled score. You know, I think I do think that there are patients that that are at extremely high risk of bleeding or have had previous serious bleeds and are at high risk of stroke. And for those patients, I think we should certainly be considering left atrial appendage occlusion as another way to prevent stroke without increasing the risk of bleeding. Good. The, the key points we want our listeners to make sure that they're aware of is, first, there are many factors associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation that are not included in a standard risk score calculator, such as left atrial dimension, which you mentioned. And, and second, a simple scoring system doesn't replace informed clinical judgment and the need for shared decision-making, as you mentioned, engaging the patients. And in our next episode, we'll look at disparities in atrial fibrillation diagnosis and treatment. Looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to listen to the other episodes in this Masterclass series and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash WQZ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available online. This activity is supported by an educational grant from the Bristol-Myers Squibb and Pfizer Alliance.